My name is John Hagee. I'm with Cal Fire Incident Management Team 3, and I'm the Fire Behavior Analyst on this team. Okay, so what we're doing is we're looking at this new technology, and this uh, technology is called the SIM table. What it does is it's a 3D overlay over a, basically a sand base, so we can uh, mold the sand to show topography. And what we can do with this new technology is we can actually put fire on the landscape and let it burn and kind of give us an idea of what the fire is doing for, as far as fire behavior and where it's going to go. So we can put the resources in the best place to uh, fight these fires. So what it is, it's a camera that overlays on a sand table. We form the sand to make the topography. And then what we do is we use a computer program which basically shoots an image of the fire onto that 3D uh, sand. And it actually shows the fire growing with inputs of weather and topography. So it gives us a good idea of where the fire may burn to. We'll be able to use this technology to basically to better fight fires. It gives us a, another tool in our toolbox to have an advantage. As we all know in California, fires burn aggressively and they damage a lot of people's property. So we want to make sure that we have all the tools available to us to be able to better fight these fires. Yeah, this is a marriage of the science and the fire service. So it's a, it's a great, great opportunity for us to get that technology from the private sector, to integrate it into the fire service and utilize it to, be, to better fight these fires. This is from the Cal Fire Training Center. It's on loan for us for this incident. As far as I know, this is the first incident it's being used on. So uh, for wildfire, I know it has been used in the past for other things, especially for training. But this is where we're going to be able to take a, a basically a 3D look at the landscape, put the fire on that landscape, and let it burn, and give us some idea of what the fire is doing, so we can make uh, decisions on how to suppress this fire. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to try to basically simulate the first burning period. We have this broken down into three different burning periods for the three days that it was active. So what we're going to do is this is Dave Levin. He's uh, actually uh, has a good technological uh, background on this, so he'll be able to help us out with those questions. So what we're going to do is it's kind of a it's it's got some inputs to it. Uh, it's got a fuel layer on side on it, but we we tweaked it to kind of make it mimic what the fire did. And there are some uh, some adjustments. So you're able to adjust the temperature, temperature, RH, wind speed, wind speed and direction. So those are some of the parameters that it, it allows us to work with and to be able to simulate those fires. So we're going to go ahead and start uh, the fire. And what we did is we ran it for six hour burn periods to begin with, kind of simulate what the burning conditions were. Yep, go ahead. So as you can see, the fire started and we just kind of put in a, in a rough area of where the fire started. I'm not sure if that's exactly where the point of origin was. As you can see, uh, for six hours, we're roughly about 815 acres which is fairly representative of, of what the fire did in that first operational period. Right now, what, some of our inputs that we have, we have the temperature at roughly 100 degrees, RH at 8, and we have the wind out of the north, which is represent, representative of what the uh, weather was like that day. So we'll go ahead and uh, start it on the second day, because remember on the second day, we had a wind shift and that wind came out of the west. So we change the wind direction and let it burn. Okay, so you can see what it did kind of in that, in that second op operational period where we had that wind shift. It kind of pushed it more towards the Indian Valley Reservoir, which is, uh, you know, where it got influence, where the slopes and drainages got in alignment with the wind. So this is again showing us, you know, where that fire was going under those specific conditions. So now we'll go ahead and go on to the third day, which was one of the most active days, and had the longest burning period. So we ran this third burning period out a little bit longer because we had heavy fire activity well into the evening. We'll go ahead and start the third one. features to it. We're able to put in barriers, we're able to put in suppression activities, we're also able to, you know, to put in landmarks and stuff so you can see on the map where you might have values at risk. So it gives us a good idea of what could happen if a fire were to start. So go ahead and look at some of the different tools. Can I explain to them what you're doing there, Dave? So some tools we have.
have for this uh, this program is we can put dozers, bulldozers, hand crews, and fire engines and uh, aircraft on the fire to see what kind of uh, effect it would have. So this, for example, is a bulldozer. I'll just put one of each tool out so you guys can see them. That's a hand crew. And if we hit play, you can see them moving along with the fire's edge. And also input aircraft. As you can see the progression of the bulldozers and the hand crews is kind of a normal production rate based on the speed that it's burning at. Yeah. So go ahead and now what we're going to do is we're going to overlay the actual perimeter as of uh, last night to see how close this ran after our simulation to what the actual fire perimeter is. That's the fire perimeter in the darker color. So it, it squirted out here a little bit further than than uh, than what the actual perimeter is. But if you can see, it's fairly close. This other part is right there. It didn't capture that that uh, little finger up to the north, but it's fairly close. But we also ran this a little bit longer on that third turn period than it was actually burning. So what it does for us from the fire behavior standpoint, it gives us another tool, like I was saying. It gives us an idea of what the fire behavior may do in certain conditions with the wind and photography. It allows us to look at, look at the values at risk that may be out in front and give the incident commander the information that he needs to make those decisions. So is there any questions? How was the technology developed? You know, the technology was developed by a private company. Uh, I'm not sure how they developed it. I know that they have a lot of different uh, uh, things that they work on. But this is a great marriage of private sector technology and the fire service coming together to get, create a tool that's going to benefit the public. And was the technology developed at the request of CAL FIRE or fire agencies or independently? You know, this is uh, from the California CAL FIRE's training center. Looked into this technology, they realized it was a great platform for training, and they were able to uh, acquire one of these. And uh, we were, the first intent was, I believe, to use it for training. Realized that it's got functionality in a lot of different avenues. Not only fire, the floods, uh, it could also be used in that type of a scenario. I believe it was used in the Orville Dam incident. So it has a lot of functionality to it. So we're looking at it from a, not just a single standpoint, but to be able to have it for a training platform and all this. What kind of efficiencies are you experiencing as a result of being able to predict the fire's action? You know, right now, we're, this is kind of a, a beta test right now. So we're not putting a lot of weight into this until we have a little bit more testing. We want to try to use it with real-time real -time weather inputs, real-time uh, fire inputs. So once we get that and we are able to fine-tune it a little bit, working with the company, we'll be able to use it more as a, uh, as a, as a tool that is an ingredient on how we make our decisions. But right now, we're just using it as an information platform. Okay. 